This episode, I want to dedicate it to my parents, who I lost them two years ago. I'll share my story, how I lost them, how I dealt and overcome the grief. I know this will be quite a heavy topic, but I think it's time we talk about this delicate topic as well. Because it's interesting how we all seem to know how to celebrate new life. But when it comes to supporting friends who are grieving a loss, we often find ourselves unsure of what to do or say. So I'll share my I'll share some do's and don'ts when dealing with people who are grieving the loss based on my own personal experience. But first and foremost, it's important to acknowledge that everyone's grief journey is unique. There is no right or wrong way to grieve. So please give yourself permission to feel the pain and allow the healing process to unfold naturally. Seek support from your friends, family or professional who can provide a safe space for you to express your express your emotions. Remember to be patient with yourself and most importantly, hold on to the love and memories you shared with the people you have lost. They will always be, be with you in your heart. So my story goes, um, before I touch down how I lost them, I'll just give a little bit of a background of uh, who my parents were. So my dad and mom, they were both born in a small city in India where the infrastructure was underdeveloped. My dad was uh, used to love maths. I think we used to discuss maths so much. I I used to call him maths genius. He used to walk two kilometers from his house at night to study under the street light on the path after finishing his chores at home. It, he wasn't getting any formal education, but uh, at the same time, he did have a school to go to. Uh, But it's amazing how he taught himself and uh, managed to do whatever was possible around that infrastructure. He was a simple teacher in school uh, and he believed in my talent, taught me the value of hard work, discipline and various life survival skills. He was a strong advocate for women's empowerment, even though he was born into a really small city in India where women's education was considered secondary. He even motivated my mom to complete her study after marriage against his family wish. My mom was a kind lady who taught me to enjoy life each day as it comes and never give up. She expressed her love through food and also taught me the importance of independence. For her, she wanted all the girl child to be independent, not be a homemaker, just um, be able to stand up on their own feet. I had moved overseas after marriage, but distance with my parents was never an issue. We used to meet every six months or less. And then uh, we are also, you know, called three times a day that would last for at least 20, 30 minutes. And someday it would go over one hour also. With my dad, I had grown really close, um, especially during COVID. Uh, We used to discuss everything from politics to maths question to job market to Bollywood education system and anything under the sun. And so was with my mom. It was an easy conversation, uh, anything. So my mom was healthy, no health concern. Um, My dad had sugar and diabetes, but everything was fine until COVID came. Um, As I live overseas, um, the borders of my country uh, was was closed, so I could not travel. Uh, So neither we could go anywhere nor anyone can enter uh, the state. So first wave was fine. We used to be in touch over the phone. It was tough for my parents as suddenly they were lonely as neither they could visit us or nor anybody could visit them. We used to be in touch via phone, um, video calls. That's about it. But I know the whole world was suffering. So it wasn't uh, just a unique uh, story for our household. But it was a time during the second wave I think I think it was during the time and we all thought COVID is almost over and my mom was uh, first had you know just the diarrhea symptom and my dad was treating her for normal diarrhea medicines um, three days into it and she developed cough but she didn't have any fever um, really bad that she could not even walk she could not even talk um, so instead of getting better it was getting worse and fourth day I think into it 
she fainted in the toilet. And that's when we started suspecting it just, it's more than just a flu. My dad had developed cold at that stage as well, but then there were no other symptoms like my mom. So my brother, who at that time uh, was not in the city, but somehow managed to, he was in India, he managed to somehow reach, uh, took them for a COVID test to the hospital and turned out both were positive. But my mom was already serious by then. And she did not want it to get admitted to hospital because there were so many news coming uh, that, you know, people were not returning from hospital and all. Uh, my dad said, I'll come with you. Anyways, he was go. He was, he had COVID. He wasn't serious. Uh, so our challenge was to find a bed, not just one, but two, because uh, my mom needed that support as well. He, my brother took uh, them to two, three hospital, but most of them would say it's full. And finally, uh, my brother, through some support of his friend, managed to get to bed in a hospital. As my mom's oxygen level was 40 at the time of admission, she was admitted to ICU and my dad was in general ward. My dad would visit her in the evening as no outsider were allowed to visit COVID patients. So because he was in the same hospital and also was getting treated for COVID, uh, my dad ensured that my mom knew he was in the hospital around and around to provide that mental support. Anyway, she fought hard. She was kept on BiPAP. Um, it's an invasive ventilation. But within two days of hospital admission, she passed away. We were devastated. I was here, borders were closed, couldn't go there could not even say goodbye to her. She could not see anyone on her last day. We knew if we told our dad, he would get emotionally panicked. And all we wanted was to bring him back safely, tell him the news when he fully recovers. Even though we knew hiding from him wasn't going to be easy because he was in the same hospital, if he go, to the ICU, he will see. So first day he went and he's like, I can't see mom. Maybe they have taken her for some extra treatment. Um, he didn't, I think, ask the staff anyways. But the very next day, I think he spoke to some of the staff to find out what happened to the patient who was here in this room. And I guess he came to know. I know it was going to be hard anyways. We kept the news from him for a day, but he found out and I was touch I was in touch with my dad via phone and text. He was heartbroken and that's when his health started deteriorating from no other symptom to suddenly oxygen was low and other symptoms started uh, arising. He asked my brother that he wants to come back home or take him to some other hospital because he was finding it tough to stay in the same hospital. I, which I can understand why he lost his companion for 39 years there. He was not in the right condition. He could barely stand because I think the dosage of antibiotics and other that he was getting um, as part of his treatment could hardly make him sit properly without, you know, with balance. So we, and we also didn't have oxygen tank at home. My brother had tried, but he could not arrange it. So we had to move him to a different hospital. And again, that was again a challenge. We needed to find some place where he could be, he could, he could find a bed. Finally, again, um, with his contact and with his, uh, some of his kind friend uh, helped him to find a bed for him. So we got the hospital. Um, but I think that the hospital policy was that we, he could not have phone with him. So now he was admitted, no one could visit him. Also no phone was allowed, so he could not even talk. It was not our choice to send him to hospital, but if we kept him home, we would have lost him in few hours as his oxygen was already coming down. I somehow from here managed to call the hospital, get in touch with the doctor. I told him that we have lost our mother just a day before, and we really want, uh, 
a dad to come back safely he was empathizing i can't remember the doctor's name but he was really nice he entertained my call, uh, call and he said that i would update you every time i visit the ward um, because i think every day his ward was changing but he was kind enough to even though he was part of different ward he would go to my dad to check on his health and give me an update the update from him was not uh, not satisfactory in the sense that he was uh, he was saying that your dad is serious it's it's getting worse because he also had diabetes and blood pressure uh, i would try to call hospital to talk to my dad because he didn't have mobile phone but nurses and staff were not really supportive and i can understand because they were dealing with large volume of patients but once um, they managed to pass the phone to my dad and uh, he could take off his bipap machine because he was at that time also on the invasive ventilation and i think he had realized that he's gonna go so he said that uh, i'm going to go just like mom so i just need two things i need my phone so i can message my bank details and pin and other stuff because he had not prepared the well and he wasn't prepared to go of course so the other wish for him was that he was, his mouth was constantly dry so and that's because you know, because of the oxygen machine and bipap so he was not getting you know his mouth was getting constantly dry because of that and when he would request for water um, you know one that maybe it was not feasible all the time and also for a staff to provide and also because there were large volume of patients so he said if you can request the staff to give me water give me water i discussed both the things with the doctor they say they don't allow phone so he can't get it the only way to get in touch would be either i speak to doctor to know his health condition or try the normal health uh, hospital number and if the line is free i could get in touch with my dad secondly the water they can't give because it would mean he have to go off the bipap machines and and then that's that's not uh that's not something he advised so i requested them if it is possible to buy some lozenges something in the throat so that it can you know uh, it it would be somehow easy um can't replace water but at least he nodded but i doubt they would have done you know would have provided i know again going back to the same statement there were so many patient uh, and i didn't even know the doctor personally so i'm not sure whether it was given to him so technically i did not fulfill fulfill any of those two wishes and the next day afternoon he left us as well border was borders were still closed for me so i could not travel and was completely hopeless and all this happened in the span of 5 days now from grieving my mom loss to praying for dad's health to not losing both of them and losing them was the hardest thing you know i can imagine for anybody it would be it left such a big void in my life i went in the dark phase my biggest support and strength were gone and i could not be there with them i had support of my family and friends that helped me cope with the loss of my parents however my grieving process is still ongoing and i still deeply miss them my process grieving process was a bit different and unique as i was not physically there few things that i did was i did not stop myself from crying i got a good support from my husband and my daughter as well we would talk about them you know all those memories that i that we had created with them i would do meditation it wasn't i couldn't even meditate but i would try i would be crying while meditating have their photos in my room i know some people prefer to remove the photos because they give them more pain for me 
it used to be a positive thing. So I, used, I would have their photos in my study room, my workplace, my bedrooms. The other thing that I did was talking to people who were a good listener and who also knew my parents. So made it easy because I was able to share my thoughts, what I was going through. I was able to talk about those memories, uh, things that they had said in the past. The other thing was I joined the work. I joined work the very next day. But again, as I said, my process was a bit different because I was not physically there. So I joined work because if I wouldn't go, I wouldn't join, I would be crying the whole day. I thought maybe it was a good way to distract myself. And I got good support from my workplace, my team, my boss. They were okay uh, for me to join at the same time. They were not there was no, you know, too much of work as well. They knew where, what I'm going through. But I was still completely homebound with no zeal to cook or anything. I was just homebound. I would just look at their photos, would work, um, do my office work. But that's about it. But I'm not all doing the office work. I'm crying. I got... You know, I, but again, my friends and family were my strength at this time. And I want to thank them all who were there with me in this in that tough time. While this challenging period, I got a good support from many individuals. Some friendship grew apart as a result as well. Because when you're mourning, you're not in the mood for entertaining or attending events. And at such times, it's possible to lose touch with some friends who may not fully understand or empathize with your grief. But again, it was hard because as it is, I was I lost both of them and some friends, uh, you know, uh, which I felt that they were not empathizing. <sighs> but that's fine. You know, if these friends have paid away during difficult time, it may indicate that they were not genuine friendship to begin with. Now, that was my journey. Like I said, I'm still healing. I still miss them dearly. Um, my phone have stopped ringing. They were the ones who I would call and I know my phone would never go unanswered. So it's it's a loss. I'm still dealing, but I'm much better. So here are some do's and don'ts, right? When dealing with friends and family who are mourning, and this is again based on my experience, which I felt personally were a great gesture from my friends. The first thing to remember is to be present and listen actively. Allow the person to express their thoughts and emotion without interruption. Acknowledge their pain. And, you know, sometimes com comforting touch or a simple words like, I'm here for you, they can provide tremendous strength as well. Again, try to put yourself in their shoes and try to understand their perspective. You know, ask open-ended questions to encourage them to share their me memories and emotion. Some people believe that talking about the person they have lost will bring pain, but trust me, at least my, uh, my experience was if they would ask about any memories, I think it was also a way for me to share those stories and get it out of the chest as well. Be patient. Let them lead the conversation at their own pace. And offer practical support, such as helping with household chores, meals, or running errands. Personally, for me, some of my friends, they got food. And that was really helpful because you're not in the mood. You're cooking or eating is not in your mind when you're mourning. But if you have kids in the house or family members, they would suffer in this process. So having that food supply in the house, that helped me immensely. <clears throat> Saying, I'm sorry for your loss. I can't imagine what you're going through. I'm here to support you. It's better to, better to acknowledge their pain than to search for right words. So these are the some of the things I think one of my friend even came um, home and took me for a walk in the park. Um, and all we did was there was not much conversation. 
I was just crying, but she was listening. That helped me as well. So if you have any friend, family member, who are you know going through this situation, be present, listen to them. If possible, take them out for a walk in the nature. Now, some of the don'ts that uh, personally, again, I felt was one of the common mistake is, you know, um, is trying to minimize their pain with well intention, but, you know, like, oh, they are in a better place. Time heals all wounds. I feel like such statement can invalidate the grief and make them feel, feel misunderstood. So avoid saying those. I think it's best to just listen. And, you know, often we go to Google and, you know, find out what message should be get, getting. I mean, it is funny that I was getting almost similar message from many uh, acquaintances and uh, friends as well. You know, those rip scripted message that you get it from Google. I would say put yourself in their shoes. If they are your good friend, you will know what to say. You will know what they must be feeling. And the third one that I felt was don't compare your loss to your own experience and suggest that you understand, you know, it gets better after certain months or some certain year. That's, like I said, every everyone's grief journey is different. So avoid comparing their loss to your own experience. There were a few very interesting statements that were told to me, and I think it didn't leave a very good taste. And I, you know, one of the statements was, uh, it was again, my dad had passed away 20 minutes into it, uh, friends had come to visit me. And it was said in a, today I understand that statement, but it was like your parents passed away on ventilation and ventilator makes it easy to go. I felt like nothing in this world <laughs> should take them away for one and secondly i mean i know it's a practical statement to make but it is not something i wanted to know at that time i understand this today after two years but not when i had just lost them 20 minutes ago the other stuff i think the other statement uh, which was common that i was getting it across give yourself six months give yourself one year and it will be fine i guess avoid saying things that suggest a timeline for the grief the other question were also oh it has been certain months i hope you're feeling better grief is deeply personal process and everyone experiences it differently the the other third um, thing that I noticed was uh, people trying to share their experience again, you know, sharing stories that I've heard the focus from their loss and make the conversation about themselves. Example, like, you know, someone said, oh, my grandmother, grandmother also had COVID. She was 85, 90, but she survived. So the person who is grieving doesn't want any bad thing for you. It's just that they're not, you know, they you shouldn't be sharing this um, with them. Just listen to their story, what happened. Empathize with their situation. Someone would say, oh, my, even my uncle had diabetes. He had a heart condition, but he still made it. And it was all coming during, like, in the first two days of those statements. So I guess um, that's all the do's and don'ts. And that brings us to the end of today's episode. To our listeners, we value your feedback and ex experiences. If you have any thoughts, questions, and additional tips on grieving that you like to share, please reach out to me. But before we sign off, let's remember that grief is not a linear process. It's okay to take one step at a time. Be patient with yourself and those around you. And remember that healing comes with time and self-compassion. I would just like to say anyone listening who may be going through similar experience, you are not alone. Reach out for support, lean on your loved ones, and remember that healing takes time. 
it's okay to ask for help. It's okay to feel a wide range of emotions. You are stronger than you know. And you will find your way through the darkness.